and welcome to the program. I'm Nayo Olangbe. We begin in Burkina Faso, where the country's leader, Lieutenant Colonel Paul Henry Sandaogo de Miba, is urging the population to stay calm and be careful. This is coming amid reports of gunfire and heavy military presence in the capital. Well, there have been reports that a coup may be taking place, but a government source who wished to remain anonymous told the BBC some soldiers had mutinied. Well, heavy gunshots have continued near the presidential palace with reports of a large blast. The military also blocked access to major buildings, including the National Assembly, the National Broadcaster, and the residence of the Prime Minister. Burkina Faso State TV was also said to have been taken off air. Burkina Faso's military junta seized power in January saying it was going to deal with the threat from Islamist militants. But the violence hasn't stopped. Well, this month has seen at least two deadly attacks. On Monday, 11 soldiers were killed after a supply convoy escorted by the army traveling to the northern town of Jibo was targeted in a suspected militant ambush. On the 5th of September also, at least 35 civilians were killed and 37 wounded after another convoy hit an improvised explosive device on a main road also leading to the north of the country. Well, jihadists have even seized land and blockaded areas in the north of the country. Well, joining us now for more discussions on this is African Affairs Analyst Okwe Okwala. Uh, thank you so much for speaking to us on Network Africa. It's always my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So what do you make of uh, the reports of an attempted coup in Burkina Faso, although government sources are saying this is mutiny and we've heard the leader calling for calm? You see, um, when the current military junta, led by Colonel Paul Henry Damba, Damiba, when they overthrew the, the, the elected government of President Kambore, they were held by rank and file soldiers as well as civilians who were frustrated by the gains being made by the Islamist militants who are taking possession of large espas of large, large area in both the north and in the east, making it impossible, controlling several villages and, 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 and towns. So the expectation was that the military that came, we impose security, we reverse the successes of these Islamists, and recover the large areas that we are that we are, have been taken over by the by the militants. But this expectation has not been met, and over time, these people who had just supported the coup or the government or the, the military junta started getting frustrated. And indeed, you know, uh, last week there were uh, several deadly attacks on both civilians and military. And then there are uh, demonstrations have been happening in different, different places in South Burkina Faso before now. So, I mean, what it shows is that one, they've not made progress. The major agenda, which was accepted, well, the people seem to accept for allowing these military people to come in at all was to reverse the successes of these uh, Islamists. But the, the junta has not been able to do that. And so, I mean, they, they started losing legitimacy and then, of course, um, frustrating us setting, not only within the civilian population, but it was also within the military rank and file. And that is what is whether you call it mutiny or whether it is uh, well, uh, for now it appears to be a mutiny. But it shows that there is, um, of course, there is frustration within the, the military, and there is, and the, the the current military junta is not is neither enjoying popularity with the military nor with the civilian population. Yes, it's quite unclear, you know, what exactly is going on in Burkina Faso at this time. But if this has been successful, it would be the sixth unconstitutional takeover in the Sahel region in the past two years. Now, what does this say, you know, 
of the democratic stability in this region because of late we've seen a wave of coups in West Africa with uh, the Mali and Guinea are currently under military regime. Um, five, six years ago, one would have said that it is unfashionable for military, military crews are unfashionable, you know, even in Africa, even in West Africa. But I don't think anybody will say so again, because, I mean, the country after country, we are backsliding to a military dictatorship. And it, it shows that the, our polity is still very unstable. And without political stability, economic progress, it will be difficult. So all, all the problems, economic inst uh, um, instability in politics, violence in terms of military cues and uh, and the militant uh, ag agitation, military agit militants agitating for one thing or the other within the South African region and the Sahel as a whole. So what that demonstrates is that look, I mean there is with a lot of work needs to be done by African leaders. But a lot of work needs to be done by leaders in this region. And to not only to ensure that democracy is beneficial to the ordinary citizens, but we can no longer take it for granted, even within the countries that have not yet witnessed Q the Qatar or military uprising. We can no longer take it for granted. We can, it's not just enough for politicians within the region to say, oh, military uh, regimes, Q the Tars are no longer fashionable. It's almost becoming, I mean, it's coming closer and closer to us, even in Nigeria. So I think and all the other governments should sit up, sit up to make sure they solve the problem. And why, for instance, why are they, I mean, they, they, there is need to build um, solidarity within the citizenry so that the, the host country can confront issues that are facing them, issues of security, issues of economic, economic, um, economic challenges. Because people will always keep looking for solution. If they don't get it from one place, they will think that you will get it from the other. And mm -hmm. so if we have democratic government and they are not delivering on what the people want, on the, what the people want, then they may say, oh, I mean, if we have tried democracy and democracy is not paying us off, why not? And well, if, 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 even if it's military, let's have it. Let's see first. And that's why those who are standing should be aware, lest right. they also fall into this temptation. All right, then. African Affairs Analyst, Dr. Yopala, thank you so much for speaking to us. It's always my pleasure. Well, Mali's transitional authorities have received a delegation of the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS, for talks on the fate of 46 Ivorian soldiers that have been detained in the country since July. According to the Malian presidency on Facebook, Military leader Cornel Asimi Goita welcomed the ECOWAS leaders as they arrived at the Modibo Keita International Airport in Bamako. The delegation comprises of Ghanaian President Nana Akufo Addo, his Gambian counterpart Adama Barrow, Togolese Minister of Foreign Affairs Robert Duse, and mediator for Mali, Nigeria's former president. Good luck, Jonathan. All over to South Africa, 14 alleged illegal minors have appeared at the Kruger's Dop Magistrate Court in Johannesburg for the rape and robbery of a music video cast and crew in July. The men made a brief court appearance, but owing to a delay in DNA testing services, the case has now been postponed for two months. So this case is in connection with the gang rape of eight women who were recording the music video on an abandoned mine in July. Our South Africa Bureau Chief Betty Debia reports. Outside the court, the crowd continued their usual protests. No media was allowed inside the court because one of the 14 accused persons was a 15-year-old boy, a minor. After a few minutes, the court was adjourned for DNA testing to be concluded. The backlogs recorded at South Africa's Forensic Services Laboratory have been highlighted by this delay in the case. The spokesperson for the police ministry, Liran Zutemba, however says backlogs have been reduced significantly from how it was at the beginning of the year. 
I do want to put on record that the ministry is fully aware of the progress that has been made so far in turning around the functioning of the FSL around the eradication of the DNA backlog, not forgetting that the forensic service laboratories are also dealing with new cases that are coming in each day. We attribute this reduction to better contract management, increased workforce, as what we've done is also doubling the lab hours and ensuring the procurement of much-needed agents and chemicals for DNA processing are acquired in time. Um, these are some of the many measures that are in place to ensure that the country really sees the back of this DNA backlogs. It is also encouraging that the SAPS and the NPA have established a joint project which focuses on the prioritization of court ready cases with outstanding forensic reports, particularly murder and rape cases. The 14 alleged legal minors are facing charges of sexual assault and robbery with aggravating circumstances. Sean Ray, a Nigerian filmmaker, was filming and directing the music video, which ended abruptly with the attack in July. He, along with his producer, who requested her identity be protected, spoke of the trauma of their ordeal. His crew also lost money and machine, but he's happy nobody was killed. The, the song was I'm Alive. That's the title of the song. And I want to believe it was because we were uh, prophesying that, that word. Because, um, I mean, we Nigerians, we are very religious. spiritual and mm -hmm. religious. So... I mean, I want to believe that's one of the reasons why we went in there and came out alive. And even while we were there, you could hear a lot of us speaking in tongues and, you know, praying. And these guys would just hit you with guns and, like, keep quiet. And, then, you know, so it was, it was uh, like, I can't really paint. If I, if I could paint a picture of what exactly happened on, on that four hours that we were held hostage, honestly... It's, 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 it feels, in fact, it is a movie, and at the same time, it is not something you would want to wish for even your enemy. The case is expected to resume on the 28th of November, 2022. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Betty Dibia, Channel's Television News. Acclaimed Zimbabwean author Sisi Dangaremga has been convicted of inciting violence by carrying a placard calling for political reform. The magistrate said the protest could have incited other people to join and cause a breach of peace. Ms. Dangaremba paid a fine of about $110 to avoid seven or three months jail term and had pleaded not guilty in a trial that critics say is the latest sign of a government crackdown on dissent. Or well, outside the court, she says she is not surprised by the conviction. Fresh air strikes against Ethiopia's northern region has killed at least six people, with rebel forces accusing neighboring Eritrea of carrying out the attack. Well, an aid worker says that Tuesday's attack targeted Adi Dairo town, located near the Eritrean border, with injured people being taken to hospital by an ambulance. The Tigrayan authorities say the airstrikes were carried out repeatedly on Tuesday and destroyed residential houses. The Eritrean government, however, whose troops previously fought alongside Ethiopian soldiers in the region, has not responded to the accusation. Well, not only do annual rains in Sudan leave dozens dead and properties devastated, but they also cause snakes and scorpions to increase in numbers. Observers say bigger snakes were sighted this year as, Sudan, as Sudanese in rural areas struggle to attain effective anti-venom against bites of the creatures. Sudan's rainy season left dozens dead and property devastated. It has also brought another threat to the country, snakes and scorpions. Attacks from these animals are more frequent during Sudan's rainy season, when water levels on the river Nile can rise and send floodwaters surging into communities. The Toxic Organisms Research Center in Khartoum said bigger snakes like cobras have been seen, killing at least one person. Manal Siam, a researcher and assistant university professor, said the main reason behind the surge is climate change. 
The increase in the number of scorpions can be caused by three reasons. The main reason is climate change, such as floods and torrential rains in the fall and high temperature in summer. Another cause is mining in some areas, such as in the Nile and northern states, because scorpions are always found in sandy, mountainous areas, so mining and exploration operations make them flee to safer places. The third reason for the increase is the random picking of scorpions, because scorpions change behavior and reproduce more when they feel danger. Siam said the available antidotes are imported from India, as Sudan does not have access to proper antidotes made specially for the venom of snakes and scorpions found in the country. The anti-venom that we import comes through the Ministry of Health and Medical Supplies. It is manufactured in Indian companies for scorpions that are originally inhabiting India and not Sudan. Therefore, the environment is different and so the poison is different. This is why the antivenom is not effective enough and most people bitten by scorpions now do not survive. Specialists from the center now organize field trips to collect snakes upon calls for help from citizens. Nationwide, more than 150,000 people have been affected by flooding this year, double the number at the same stage of last year's rainy season. Africa's power situation and the opportunities for investment came under spotlight at the International Trade and Investment Forum 2022, organized by the Foreign Investment Network on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly in New York. Attending this year's event were global leaders, finance experts and bright minds in forward-thinking solutions for Africa's perennial power problem. Dr. Ngozi Okonjo, the Finn International Trade and Investment Forum 2022, with the theme, Power for Africa, was organized to serve as a launching pad for the international business community to explore investment opportunities for Africa's power sector. Discussions were broken into several panels to address the need for international partnerships, direct investment consultants and group chairman, Foreign Investment Network, Olainka Fayomi, and U.S. Councilwoman Mercedes Narcisse um, set the scene for the program. We have the body to help 43 million youth in Africa who are jobless today just because they lack opportunity to, one, opportunity to electricity, two, opportunity to technology knowledge. And I'm hoping that some of us today here will be able to help us to get to that level. Well, my job is primarily passing laws and passing the city's budget. I firmly believe that what we do at the city council does have a profound effect on international finance. Our work in the city council can accelerate economic activity through business development and fostering the technological innovations, which I believe in and improve economic and financial condition at home here in our city has a tremendous effect on the strength of the global economy. With 770 million Africans living without electricity, and much of that number in sub-Saharan Africa, former Nigerian president, Ulushiko Basanjo, who joined the program virtually, says it's imperative that Africa and her partners work together to generate enough power to help African development. I personally believe that the resources are out there. All we need to do is to create the conducive environment for investment to come into Africa for power generation, power distribution, and of course, power transmission. Director General of the World Trade Organization, Dr. Ngozi okonjo wiala who also joined virtually, highlighted the annual investment gap for Africa, hence the need for improved energy access to improve well-being on the continent. We know that the International Energy Agency has estimated a $28 billion annual investment gap for energy for the continent up to 2030. 
We also know we cannot industrialize or have a solid continental manufacturing base without energy. We cannot increase our shelf world trade without adding more value to our products through that manufacturing base. In other words, our future well-being on the continent is limited by improved energy access. President and CEO of Amelia, Chetan Dube, gives artificial intelligence, which will most likely determine the future of a workforce in the world and where Africa will be by then. I haven't gone to bed or woken up without having that question haunt me. So I, I, I welcome you for the next nine minutes along in that journey. And I invite a continent of remarkable brain power to join in this revolution that is imminent upon us. The program continues with panel sessions, which further discuss Africa's energy needs and ends with an award ceremony to distinguished persons in various industries. Congratulations. <laughs> well, South Africa and South Korea are celebrating 30 years of friendship. And as part of that, a group of young men have been touring South Africa, sped, spreading the message of inclusion through music. Formed in 2015, Dream with Ensemble is an 11-member group which has won hearts and awards around the world with their musical skills, despite what would have been described as their challenges. The group played a number of crowd favorites at the Nelson Mandela Foundation in Johannesburg. This one, Africa, by the group Toto, they say, is a tribute to global icon Nelson Mandela. Dream with Ensemble is a South Korean group which holds concerts to raise awareness about disabilities through music. The award-winning group of 11 comprises members with developmental challenges and with their music they say, when prejudice sleeps, may the heart hear music. <laughs> Four City Tour of South Africa has seen them perform with groups like the Cape Town Philharmonic Orchestra. They also played in Durban and in Pretoria for the country's Heritage Day celebrations the past weekend. Here in Johannesburg, they shared a stage with the Sibonile School for the Blind. <laughs> I think uh, we can expand our, you know, the bilateral relations and exchanges in the, uh, you know, the especially cultural centers sector, and then also, you know, the especially in the area of uh, disabilities. So I think this is uh, only a starting point of our further engagement in the artist between our two countries in, in terms of our disability. The message, according to the organizers, is to spread the message of inclusion of persons with disabilities far and wide, especially in the rural areas. In terms of ensuring that these activities do take place in rural areas and in communities and everywhere where we are, is, the, is actually all of our responsibility. However, I must indicate that already they are taking place. What we short of is actually a, a participation of society whenever these particular engagements happen in our localities. I think there's a lot we can do, which we are not doing at the moment, uh, to try to bridge the gap um, between uh, ourselves and people with, with disabilities. You know, you, you look at um, how people are treated when they have particularly uh, developmental challenges. Um, they are treated in a particular way. The people stare at them. People um, uh, uh, kind of uh, look at them in a way that suggests that they are not normal. That's it on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. Have a lovely weekend. Bye. Bye.